All right, today we have a fun toolbox episode around quieting your inner critic. And many of us may be really familiar with our inner critic. If you're growth minded and listening to this show, you've had those moments of self doubt, wrestling with your inner critic, and oftentimes listening to your inner critic and moving away from the goals in your life. And this comes up again and again in all of our coaching programs that. You can have all of the strategies in the world and you might be listening to this show to gain those strategies, but if your inner critic keeps you from taking action in your life, those strategies are for naught. So today, Michael's joining Johnny and I, and we're gonna talk about what this inner critic is, why it exists in the first place, how it might be leading us astray, and of course, there's a lot of information online on different ways to shut it down, defeat it, battle it. And we're going to talk about a different approach to your inner critic that I think is going to resonate with a lot of you if you find yourself battling it constantly and losing that battle. So Michael, as you join us, we love bringing in the science and I love to kick this off by just talking a little bit around the evolutionary reason for us even having this inner critic in the first place, because many in our audience are frustrated by it. How has it helped us? How has it protected us as humans? Yeah, that's I, I can geek out about that uh, so much because when I first learned about this reason, it all clicked for me. Like I'm certainly someone who uh, has been held back by my inner critic quite a lot, especially in my in my younger years. And learning where that heavy and difficult and berating voice was coming from was such an eye opener. So so here we go. The inner critic, when I asked participants in, in coaching groups in Unstoppable, what their inner critic is telling them, it's usually along the lines of, you're not good enough, don't do this, you're going to fail, give up. That's kind of the theme that they, that they find. Now, where, where would you find this evolutionarily? You can go back um, quite a lot of millions of years and you would still see the inner critic, uh, particularly in cooperative mammalian species. So the best example would be chimps or dogs, wolves. Um, you see an inner critic in them. Now, this is a little bit of a, a leap here that, that we need to make because, of course, a wolf doesn't have an inner voice that tells them, hey, you know, you're not good enough. You're not wearing your fancy suit. You can't do this. But a wolf will do the following. The moment a wolf will fight with an equal and they aren't strong enough, they will submit. They will roll on their back and they will literally um, show with their body language, I am giving up. I'm not putting up a fight. I'm out of this um, complete submission. It's a little bit of a code program that says, if you're facing an equal who is stronger, give up. And that's what we as humans, we're doing now uh, when the inner critic speaks up. It's that, that piece of software that is still there that makes us roll over and avoid danger. So a wolf or a chimp will give up so they don't get beaten to death by the alpha. And it works. It's, it's evolutionarily adaptive. If I don't roll over, I will be killed in that fight. So those wolves, chimps, and so on that didn't have that early inner critic, they didn't have offspring. They were killed in the first fight they got into. And so this carries over to all of us now that survived thanks to our inner critic but it now shows up in a different way. So for us, like rarely do you see people in, a, in, in an argument, like roll over on their back and expose their throats and bellies, right? That, that I don't know about Los Angeles or Las Vegas, but you know, here in Europe, that happens very rarely. Um, but it does happen internally. So the moment humans develop this language and their complex way of thinking, we, we started doing something as a species that is about as useful as a glass hammer. We're trying to solve problems that are in our mind with our mind. Because we've learned that our mind is really powerful, right? If I realize that I would like to have my living room painted blue, my mind goes to work, finds the solution, gets the paint, gets the brushes and starts painting. Problem solved. So now if I have a problem in my mind, like I couldn't ask that person out. I couldn't ask for a race. Um, I couldn't, I, I can't get on that sales call, whatever it is. Our mind jumps in and tries to solve that. And it doesn't work. Like the inner critic is so old and so 
strong, it doesn't listen to our prefrontal cortex. When our inner critic says, hey, this is dangerous, this project, if you start it, you're going to embarrass yourself, you're going to lose money, you're going to get rejected, you're going to be uh, looked at as, as a fool, um, give up. Don't put up a fight. Don't even try. What we're doing, though, is we're trying to outthink that system. We're tr trying to outthink the inner critic, and it just doesn't work. It's, I like to, and I'll, I'll end there with my evolutionary like history. I'll, I'll end with uh, the, me the metaphor of the, the grandmother who just, you know, if, if you had a grandmother like me, like I wouldn't leave the house without two jackets and gloves and, you know, just be safe. The world is, is dangerous. Don't do anything. Like be safe, which comes theoretically from a really good place of I just want to protect, but it's just too much. And that's what's holding us back. All right, tons of the breakdown. So yes, that mechanism is adaptive, but only adaptive in mammals that are from herd species because it allows them to find a pecking order somewhere so, so that they can maintain and stay in that herd and find a way then to be a contributor to that herd and solidify its place. The other parts to this, maybe for the, the wolves, they don't want to be killed, but because we're a little bit more advanced, that backing down from those challenges will keep us from failing in front of others, which could lead to rejection, could lead to being outcast, to be unaccepted. And so not only are we, we're trying not to get killed out here, right? We're trying to maintain, uh, bring in friends, contribute, be accepted to a, and be a part of a community. And so there's a lot of those things that, that weigh on us that will feed that inner critic to tell us to chill out, stop, pull back, don't go for it. Well, that inner critic loves certainty. And a lot of what we're talking about here, getting on stage, asking someone out, asking for the raise, well, there's a level of uncertainty with how you'll be perceived, what the reaction's going to be, are they going to say yes or no, are other people going to see you fail? So that inner critic loves the certainty and safety of saying, don't do that, don't go there, don't sacrifice yourself, don't move towards that fear, you could get hurt, you might not be good enough, you could be a loser. So... Of course, what we found with many of the clients we work with is this inner critic, you may have one clear example of it showing up in your life, but when you really start to unpack it, you see it in a lot of different areas of your life where you end up playing safe and keep from moving towards your goals, keep from reaching those heights and that potential that you feel you have inside of you, all because the inner critic loves that certainty, loves that safety. I, I specifically remember one participant of Unstoppable who uh, told me in the very first session, he said, you know, my, I have this, this voice that comes up um, that says, I'm not funny. I'm not good at telling stories. He told me that he, when, when he agreed to social events, uh, his inner critic would speak up like an hour or two before the event and he would start canceling it. He wouldn't speak up at work and ask for help because the inner critic might say or will say, the inner critic will say, hey, you're not worthy of help. They will laugh at you, you know, submit and appease, keep your mouth shut. Now, that's not how you, you know, should be going through life. There are better ways of doing that. Now, with this inner critic, oftentimes it is relying on a bit of data from a previous experience. So maybe you had one clear moment in your childhood where you did fail spectacularly and people said you're a terrible storyteller or you got really negative feedback getting on stage or your parents said to you, hey, you can't possibly do that. You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. And your inner critic will cling to that certainty of that one data point and say, okay, we now know not to put ourselves in that situation again. We don't want to be scolded by mom and dad. We don't want to be made fun of on the playground. We don't want to be ostracized from the group. So it might not feel like submitting to the herd of chimps who are stronger than you or to the herd of wolves that could beat you into submission, but you are submitting to a past experience that your inner critic is holding on to and overcompensating for. So oftentimes when you recognize these moments in your life, you can start to then 
think about some other times, like maybe you're holding on to a past experience a little too strongly and giving that inner critic a little too much sway in your actions, in your goals and ambitions. I think there's also something that is that is interesting to to look at when uh, you see how your inner critic acts with that clear and present danger that is out there if you were to do X, Y, or, or C. Um, and that is, it never gets angry. It never tells you to try harder. Like the inner critic doesn't say, hey, get back up, you know, try harder, get your shit together. Tomorrow, you know, twice the speed. Why? Because when, when you're in a fight with the alpha male and you're a chimp, and you do that, you get beat to death. So the inner critic is literally, don't get angry. Don't like just appease, just submit, just quieten down. Like everything is a threat, go and hide. And of course, that go and hide leads to you avoiding what we call danger or those goals and ambitions that you have for yourself. Because there is a level of uncertainty in all of those things that are really meaningful to you. Getting that promotion, getting up on stage, finding that partner, asking for that raise, there's going to be a level of uncertainty in how the other person's going to interact. But that's also the reason that it's a goal and ambition. It wouldn't be a goal or ambition if it was something that you could easily achieve. So there's this duality to it where the inner critic comes up, but we know we want this one thing. We know we want to get ahead in our career. We know we want to find that partner. But in that moment where the inner critic expresses that doubt, and tells us to quiet down, sit down, not say anything, cancel those plans. It leads to a level of certainty for the inner critic, but not a level of happiness for you personally. And that is because evolutionarily speaking, happiness was never the goal. Big goals were never the goal, like just survive and that's enough. And the reason that it was so important for me to talk about like where this stuff is coming from to begin with is that I see in, in a lot of like courses and programs when I work with our clients, they think they're the only ones. They think something is broken. And it's important to realize, hey, you know, everyone has an inner critic and they have it for a really good reason. And if, you, if your ancestors didn't have an inner critic, they wouldn't be around anymore. You wouldn't be around anymore. So really this inner critic as much as a, as a pain in the butt that it is, it kept you alive, your, your ancestors, your family tree alive until here. It wants you to be safe. It's not an enemy, even though it feels like one. It's your overprotective grandma that doesn't want you to see you get into the dangerous situation again. I want to make a, dis a distinction there as well. AJ was discussing about that duality, and he also mentioned about playing it safe. Though we have this internal drive to be safe and to continue on and to, to find our place within the herd without getting killed. We also have a drive to procreate, right? To acquire status, to acquire wealth that help us within that herd. So we have this internal battle that continually goes on. And this is why we end up getting angry at ourselves because we we all know the things that motivate us that drive us that that wake us up every morning the things that we see on social media that we're like oh i would love that oh a trip around the world i want that oh to, to go to europe and and explore oh i want that to come back home to my tesla and mansion well yeah i want that but yet I have to do all these things that push me outside my comfort zone in order to begin to climb to the top in order to get those things. And along the way, there is plenty crevices and threats that are on that mountain that are going to take me out. So I need to figure out a way to not only play it safe, but inch my way towards those goals. Now, that mindset right there is not going to get you anywhere fast. <laughs> and, and it is. And when you look at it, think about the people who have gotten those things where we would consider self-made. They had figured out a way to be bold and brave and break the chains of that inner critic. And that's a fight that every one of them have won at certain times of battle, but will continue to face for every rung of the ladder that they want to climb. We've had some incredible, amazing people on this show, and every one of them 
have had that discussion with us. Sometimes after we hit the end, after we hit stop, I can't tell you how many times. And of course, if you follow the show for a while, you recognize that a lot of the guests we have don't do a lot of podcasts. They haven't been on a lot of shows. And when Johnny and I hit stop, there's this sigh of relief. And sometimes they'll outwardly express, my inner critic was telling me, I'm going to be a terrible guest on this show. I'm not going to be helpful to your audience. I'm surprised at how great that interview was because my inner critic told me to cancel. And it's interesting because we get to experience this after we hit the stop button. But for many in our audience who are listening to these great guests, you think you build up this belief in your mind that they don't have this inner critic, that they've somehow overcome it once and it's not an ongoing discussion. They've figured out how to defeat it, how to silence it, how to submit it. And of course, one of my favorites was interviewing David Goggins. Now, of course, David Goggins, you may have caught the clips on YouTube, went wildly viral over his argumentative, in-your-face brashness, right? Telling you to call your inner critic a bunch of names and battle it into submission. And it was funny, when we were bringing him up to the studio, he was deadly silent in that elevator ride up to the studio. And then he himself had to flip the switch to become Goggins in order to defeat that inner critic to have a great interview. So he was having the battle with the inner critic before our eyes in that elevator ride. And this is a guy who, when you see his clips online, you think, oh, he's defeated him because he's gotten louder, brasher. He's made that inner critic submit like the wolf, like the alpha chimp. I want to add to that story as well, because he even admitted it to us. Now, when we interviewed David, uh, at the time, he was still on the rise up. Not many people knew who he was. He had been on Rogan once, and there was a lot of interest in David, but he was just finishing his book, and he knew that the next chapter and the next challenge in his life was to do all the social media to promote that book. And AJ, it was either you or me. We asked him right there in that moment, what's the, the next mountain or challenge that you have that you are nervous about considering everything you did? And we're waiting for some crazy physical challenge that he was about to us. He's like, actually guys, it's doing what I'm doing right here, right now, right now. in this room <laughs> with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and and it just goes to show you that no matter who you are, what you do, what you've accomplished, if you are moving forward and you are looking to acquire new heights and experiences in your life, you will have to deal with the inner critic. And you will either learn to turn towards growth or you will go to your default mode, which is programmed into you, as Michael said, for millions of years and turn away. That's the programming that you have to be. Now, we're going to get into that. And we're going to tell you guys how that is done. But I also want to share some stories uh, from our clients who have been through these efforts to learn how to turn towards it and in our own challenges of where we've had to learn to turn towards it. And I always say that as an entrepreneur, this line of work is not for the faint of heart because you're constantly having to learn to do new things. And because of that, your inner critic has free reign to, to mess with you all the time. In fact, I, I deal with it like anybody else. But because of the work that we do here, because of what I've learned from Michael and all of the guests that we've had in the 15 years of doing this job, I've learned when I am feeling those emotions and a heightened emotional state, that growth is on the other side of that and to turn towards that. So the writing that I do, there was a time where I was definitely afraid of having to push publish on something that I had written for this company. Now it is something that I do regular and weekly, and it's still a challenge. Sometimes I'm staring at a blank page like, what am I going to write about today? But again, in those moments, and I might even get angry, but the growth 
is to start clucking away on the keyboard and the and to make sure that something goes out. And and for all of us, we find these moments every day. And and Michael certainly. Uh, you have uh, faced more adversity than a lot of folks and had to learn how to turn towards that growth. Oh, yeah. My inner critic was like rampant. I was, I feel like my entire teenage life um, being bullied a lot in school, moving schools, moving new, to a new area, being the new kid in school with a disability, I felt constantly made fun of and, and, and bullied. And I, I feel like my entire teenage years felt like Michael never opened his mouth because the inner critic was had learned from that past experience. If you say something, the classroom will laugh. So don't say anything anymore. But I will say for myself that I've come to a place where I, I seem to have a pretty good relationship with my inner critic. Uh, we had uh, Kristen Neff on the show a few months ago, uh, like one of the lead researchers in this field. And before she was on the show, I had done a, a couple of days training with her and she did this exercise where she said, okay, you know, we're going to tap into your inner critic. You think of a situation that uh, brings, brings up something for you and then just write down what the inner critic is saying. And at the end of the exercise, I was thinking, I'm not, I don't think I'm doing this right. And I raised my hand. I said, excuse me, Kristen, I, I think I'm doing this wrong. I find my inner critic is like, dude, you're trying. It's okay. And I was like, am I doing this wrong? She said, maybe you've done enough work on yourself uh, that your inner critic, that you've, your inner critic is still the same, but the relationship has, has changed to it. Johnny, you said, you said something earlier when you, when you're talking about like publishing articles on, on the website sure. about having that fear response when your finger was hovering over the publish button and how that slowly got less and less as, as you did more and more of this. Mm -hmm. And, and that is part of the solution of dealing with the inner critic. Because remember what the inner critic is doing. It knows there is a clear and present danger from past experience and it wants to protect you. So it stands between you and that goal. It's in the middle and it says, no, 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 this is danger. Now, what everyone, this is because this is how we've been culturally conditioned. What we're trying to do is we're going to argue with the inner critic. We're going to beat our way through it. That thing, it's going to beat you at chess like 10 times out of 10. Like you're not winning against your inner critic. But what we could do um, is to go around the inner critic, go to that dangerous thing, to that goal, to that ambition, and try it out. And what happens? Either you succeed, or you learn, or you realize, you know what? I actually failed, but it's not half as bad as I thought it would be. And your inner critic gets a tiny little bit smaller because it's energy efficient. If there's not a, not a big danger, I don't have to speak up that loudly. So you do that again and again and again. You go where the you go where the fear lies. You know you go where the danger is, and you show your inner critic, hey, you know actually, uh, this is not as bad as you thought. And the inner critic will pre start preserving energy. Be like, okay, then I don't have to speak up. I can take a nap. This is when you know the the inner critic kind of sh starts shutting up and goes and has a drink. And a way in which we do that in Unstoppable, for example where the participants often struggle with social anxiety, with the fear of getting rejected, embarrassing themselves when they talk to strangers. I have them go out into a public place and have them do a little bit silly exercises. Like they might go out there and lie down on the sidewalk or lie down in the mall. And their inner critic in week one is on fire. Like it's doing a handstand on the mental catastrophe curve. And they're like, I could never do that. And then they tell me how they've been walking around that mall for like three hours. And then they realize this is not getting better. I have to like do this. And the next week they come back to our Q&A session and they share with, with, with me and with the others and say, the first time this was so scary. It took me like an hour or two before I, I dared do it. But the fifth time I did it, I didn't even shrug anymore. Like I didn't even break a sweat. It was so easy. What's the next challenge? Because this one isn't triggering my buttons anymore. And, and that, is, that is the way to deal with the inner critic. You go around it. You show it, hey, this dangerous thing, this dream that I have, it's not scary at all. Let me show you. That's why we're calling this quieting the inner critic. Because in our experience, the more you listen to the inner critic and give up, submit, roll over, the louder it gets it becomes more confident. It feels more comfortable expressing itself in various areas of your life. 
oh, I kept you safe from public speaking. Now I'm going to keep you safe from saying anything out of turn in your first date. Oh, I kept you safe from your first date. Now we're not going to go to that social event. We're going to put on Netflix. So your inner critic starts to make itself really comfortable in your life and guide a lot of your decisions and actions in ways that keep you away from those goals and ambitions. But the more you actually go around the inner critic, the quieter that inner critic becomes in other areas of your life. So even if you're not feeling socially anxious, but you're stepping outside of your comfort zone in a moment where that inner critic's going to say, hey, that's unsafe. People are going to look at you. You're going to find that in other areas then when that inner critic might feel like speaking up, it's just going to be a little bit quieter. It's turning the volume down on that inner critic in other areas of your life. And that's why so many of the graduates of Unstoppable, they then relish those moments that they hear their inner critic again, because they know just the other side of it is that goal and ambition and that purpose that they have been holding themselves back from in their lives. And they start to move towards the inner critic. Like, how else can I challenge myself? Where else can I get this inner critic to speak up? And that's one of my favorite takeaways from the Unstoppable program. When we talk and interact with graduates months, even years later, and they're like, you know, I never realized that my inner critic was keeping me from writing that book or starting that side hustle business or moving to a new town or backpacking alone across Europe. I thought my problem was I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't realize that my problem was my inner critic was guiding my actions in all these areas of my life that are really fulfilling and a ton of fun for me now. So I booked that trip. I stamped my passport. I launched that book. I created the website on the weekend, and now I have an Etsy, and now I have an e-com store and an Amazon business. And they found us because, well, they had a fear of public speaking, or, well, they weren't sure how they were going to communicate on that first date, and they wanted to feel more confident in those areas. Yeah, that's why I love the program, because when you sit and reflect about what is it that you would like to do if you had a million dollars, right? If you played that game. And of course, everyone's like, wow, I'd be at the beach. I'd be partying. I'd be getting there. Like, okay, after the, <laughs> the celebration, <laughs> now we're going to get in and they're like, oh, well, then they start to think about what their, what their core values are and the things that they would like to be doing. They get into a place of, of passions and they want to engage with those passions. And, and then when you get to that point where you're discussing the passions that you have and why you would be engaging in them, then the question is, well, then why aren't you doing them? Then you come up with your laundry list of all the reasons why you can't be engaging in those passions. That, none, that laundry list is what your inner critic had given you in order to keep you from engaging in your passions. If your inner critic wasn't there, you wouldn't have that laundry list and you would be engaging in that. That is exactly why uh, I got into self-development. It was why I was like, well, why can't we just start a business? Uh, here's a laundry list. Well, yeah, I get it. There's a laundry list, but <laughs> just go. It's the reason... Uh, that I had continued playing in music this whole time from an early age throughout my whole life because it was the thing that I love to be doing. I have plenty of reasons why I shouldn't be doing that. I could come up with a laundry list as big as anybody else's, but I realized that laundry list is useless. It's keeping me from things that enhance life for me. So when you start to think about what are those things that you want to be engaging in, at the other side of that is what is going to enhance life. It's going to make you enjoy waking up early every day to get after it. When you have an, at the end of your day, you're excited to get to bed early because you can't wait to do it again. But if you're going to bed and you're staring at the ceiling and you're freaking out, that's because your inner critic is having its way with you. If you learn to quiet it, you would be more productive. You would be living a more fulfilling life. You would be engaging in things that make life worthwhile. And if you're not, 
Well, your inner critic at the, up until this point right here and that we're speaking to you right now has won the battle, but has not won the war. There's a, this little anecdote when I speak to young men who are about late 20s and this happens a lot and it just seems to be more and more. And I think COVID has brought a lot of this out of people because a, a lot of folks had just sat and waited it out, but they're not content. They're in discontent and they're not fulfilled and they're wondering what's going on. And for a lot of these people, they have great jobs. Uh, they're in great relationships, but they feel as if something was amiss. And then we start discussing things like how old Magellan was when he set sail. I was 25 years old. And, when I, and I always ask everybody, how old was Magellan when he went and set sail around the world and all his adventures are like, I don't know, probably like 50. No. And in fact, people <laughs> weren't living very well at 50 during those times. But because he dove into his passions and was bold and brave enough to know what he wanted to do and went after it. And that is why he set sail at that age because of the glory that was on the other side of that. And for all of you young people listening to the show, if you're staring at the ceiling and your mind is racing, it is because the things that mean the most to you uh, have been left to the side while you pursue what you think is the right answer or what you felt was the safe thing to do because your inner critic up until this point has been winning. There's something that's happening behind the lines here, Johnny, that I think you painted a really good picture. The system works like this. If there is a goal or an ambition that you have in your life, the bigger it is, I can't pronounce his name in English, Michelin. Magellan? Michelin. That sounds like a tire. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know like what, what big ambition he had if, when, when he got on the boat. Maybe he just wanted to pick up chicks. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> okay, <let's see>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm getting myself into trouble here. Anyway, so I don't know how much of a goal or an ambition if he said like sales saying, hey, I'm going to find the, the new world. But the, the bigger the goal that you put up for yourself, the louder your inner critic is going to be. So in, at step number one, that means the fact that your inner critic speaks up is a good sign because you're not in your comfort zone. You're chasing something. You're going after your values and your goals. So if your inner critic speaks up, congratulations, you're doing it right. That, that is the first thing. The other thing you should notice is that when you go after that thing, like, like you just said, AJ, the moment you go after that thing, even though your inner critic speaks up, it's going to fight harder. It's going to get louder. But notice also that the moment you decide to postpone that goal, to give up on it, your inner critic goes away. It's silent. It's done its job. So what our brain learns is that, oh, if that voice is really hurtful to me, all I have to do is give up on my dreams and it's going to go away and it's comfortable. So notice that it's very, this is why we're giving up to the inner critic so often, because it makes life better in the very short term. And our brain goes, oh, that worked. I'm going to do that again next time. That's how that system works. One thing that I feel a lot of members of our audience do, and I know I did this, was try to out-lawyer and out-argue their inner critic and bring logic in and be forceful and rebut what their inner critic is saying and create this, in their mind, hopefully feedback loop where they can just keep battling and negotiating with this inner critic until finally the inner critic submits. And I think that may work for a handful of people, but... For a lot of people, that's not working. That's probably why you're here listening to the show. So I'd love to share sort of what we can use science for and give us our audience some new tools to work with this inner critic, recognize it's going to be there. We understand why, evolutionarily speaking, it is there and how it is keeping us safe. We also realize it's an impediment to our goals and dreams and our ambitions. And right now, battling it, arguing it, trying to outlogic it and get in that discussion isn't really working. So what can we be doing, Michael, to give our audience some more tools to navigate this inner critic so they can reach those goals, understanding that it's never going to go away? We, we touched upon the first part of this earlier when we said we have to go around the inner critic towards that danger slash 
uh, goal that we have. Now, that is easier said than done because going around during a critic, you're going to get a lot of stuff thrown your way. Um, but there's there's another path to take. And this was first brought into the Western world by a Chris Neff, of whom we talked about a little bit earlier, who did a lot of research around self-compassion. Now, self-compassion sounds uh, at first glance a little bit like woo-woo and fluffy, but it's actually a super powerful concept. So we need to dig a little bit into how to apply self-compassion so that it becomes what, what many um, psychologists call fierce self-compassion. Um, fierce self-compassion is, for example, what for fierce compassion is what the firefighter has that runs into the house to save the kids and the dog, right? That's not like woo-woo, fluffy, soft, I'm going to get a cup of cocoa. That is like, no, you know, fierce compassion, I'm going to risk my life to save these people. And, and that's the kind of self-compassion we, we're talking about here. And Chris Neff has on her on her website, she lists like close to 3000 studies that look at the effects of self-compassion. And that's a real lot because this stuff only really made it into the Western world in like the, the early 2000s. Um, and and what, they, what they found before we talk about how to apply it is that self-compassion added to any kind of behavior change is always giving it a boost. To be a little bit more precise here, if, for example, you try to stop smoking and you try the, the gold standard, you'll still do better if you try the gold standard plus a little bit of self-compassion. If you're working on weight management, study around that. Um, if you use the gold standard for weight management, you're going to do good. But if you use self-compassion on top of that, you're going to do a lot better. Like There's so many studies out there that show that self-compassion added to any behavior change is just going to outperform the gold standard. So what is self-compassion? To not get too scientific about it, self-compassion means talking to yourself as you would to your best friend. It's not the beating up. It's not, hey, buddy, give up. Just chill on the couch. Forget about the goal. You're not worthy. You're, you're too stupid. You're a loser. You couldn't pull that off anyway. Like We wouldn't talk to our best friends like that, right? Uh, we would say, hey, how, how can we do this? How can we make this easy? What's the first step? What, what, what needs to happen right now? I'm with you all the way. This is how we would talk to our best buddy if they were confronted with the same problem. And that is the idea of self-compassion, of being our own best friend in pursuing that. So as you go around that inner critic, you're doing it with your best buddy, with your wingman on, on the side. Because at, at, the end, at the end of it all, like for all your life and for the rest of your life, there was exactly one person that knows everything you know, that has been with, with you all the way, experienced everything, has all your bad memories. And that's the person you look at when you look in the mirror in the morning. And you better make sure that you have a really good relationship with that person. And, and when you develop that relationship, that is what's called self-compassion. I think with the most important word that you said there is that it needs to be developed. So many people are looking for the, the psychological switch that they can flip so they can just kill the inner critic and do the things that they want to do. And of course, uh, we always hear all oh, that, the self-compassion thing, it didn't work for me. I tried to be friends with myself and it, was, it was still there. No one said it was going to end. We said it was a was a was going to be a continuous battle as long as you continue to strive for more and more greatness in your life and outside of your comfort zone and that it needs to be developed. Think about up until this point, every time that you had turned away from growth and that you backed down due to your inner critic, you have given it more strength. And we are looking to take that strength back. And you have to look at it as a locomotive that is barreling down the track. And this thing is trucking by. And not only is it just not going to, you're going to flip a switch and it's going to change directions. The first thing that we have to do is slow it down. And then once we've slowed it down, getting it to move in the right direction, that is a process that you have to devote yourself to commit to while this happens. But here's the best part of it. Once the process begins, each day gets better and better. As long as you stay on that path and committed to that practice, it gets easier and easier. And then slowly, it's not an inner critic anymore because the way you are treating it as a best friend, it is treating you as a best friend. 
And I think it's important to recognize here that there's action tied to it. So part of it is a recognition that failure is a part of the process. Not every goal is attainable in your first try. In fact, if it was, it's probably not a good goal for you. <laughs> you probably want to stretch yourself a little bit further. So I think a lot of times this perfectionism comes up, right? I feel like the inner critic and perfectionism is doing this dance where it's like, well, if I can't get it right the first time, I'm not going to do it at all. Well, you're going to fail. Well, then I'm not going to do it because it's not going to be perfect. Now, just telling yourself, hey, you did a great job. Hey, better luck next time. But not taking that action the next time is not really your best friend, right? It's letting you off the hook. So I think, and we had Kristen on the show previously, and self-compassion came up in the discussion. It came up in the X Factor Accelerator and Unstoppable sessions where this idea of self-compassion is often tied to just, okay, well, I need to have my inner dialogue be a little bit more positive and a little bit more uplifting, and I just got to cheer myself up. Yeah, you can cheer yourself up while you're playing the PS5 and, and while you're throwing on another Netflix show, but that's not really self-compassion. That's just you allowing your inner dialogue to relax a bit after that inner critic came up. Self-compassion is an outward behavior. My grandma called that a pity party. Exactly. Self-compassion is not a pity party. It's not letting yourself off the hook and feeling pitiful about your previous result or that imperfection that you had. It's still an outward movement of action towards the goal. It's a recognition and a celebration that you took the step, you fell down, your inner critic was there, present, but you took the step. And what can we do tomorrow to get you back to the gym, to get you running a little bit longer, to get you on stage a little bit longer, to get you feeling a little bit more discomfort at the next social gathering? Not to say that we need to change the goal entirely or we need to quit. And I think that's where when we hear self-compassion, it feels a little ooey gooey. It feels a little woo woo. If you don't tie it to an outward behavior of action in that direction the next time. This is a very common question that comes up. Like if I become my own best friend, won't I just slack? I would argue like maybe you need better friends if that's how your friends treat you and they like sit you down on the couch, turn on Netflix and feed you ice cream. But, but in reality, like think about the, the perfect friend you would want to have in your life. What would that person say to you as you struggle going to the gym? That person wouldn't take out the whip and go like, hey, you know what? Move. That person might be like, hey, you know what? I know it's hard. This sucks. It sucked for me too. The first six months are hard. How about we start with 45 minutes and have an ice cream at the end? or something like that. I say, yeah, 45 minutes I can do. The classic metaphor for that is that if you imagine you're in elementary school and you have two teachers and one teacher, every time you fail or you fall short, you get yelled at and or puts you in the corner, shames you, makes you feel bad about yourself. But you have the other teacher who says, hey, I know this is hard. You failed just now. Can we try again tomorrow? What could we do differently? What do you think, right? Which teacher do you think you would have more success with? The compassionate one, not the one with a stick, right? And, and so many people I find, especially in a in like super productive hustle society, they feel like they need to go through their entire life with a stick behind their back so that they can achieve things. What kind of freaking life is that when you turn 120 years old and you didn't live a single day in your life without you know beating yourself up, yelling at yourself and using the stick? When... Uh, Self-compassion works just as well, if not better, without the stick. So, so let's do that. Let's act on that. It's also not the opposite of just quitting entirely. So that, that's the other side of the coin. And, and we see this with weight loss. We see this with trying to build new habits of like, oh, I was, I was on a chain. I was 19 days in a row of eating good. And, and then I had that cheeseburger. Or then I slept in. Or then I had that sip of alcohol. And it just wipes away the previous 18 days. And you're just like, I give up. Self-compassion comes in and says, okay, well, what can we do tomorrow to get back on track? Maybe it's have the salad for lunch. Maybe it's remove the alcohol from the house. Maybe it's put yourself on stage in a different way by speaking up in a Zoom meeting, right? So it's really important to recognize that when we're talking about self-compassion, and we did a presentation on this in another group, 
it's not about just sitting there and having this internal rose-colored glasses dialogue with yourself. You're so great. You're smart enough. You're sharp enough. You can do it. But it's then tied to, well, what are you doing now that you've felt that bit of compassion for yourself? What is that next step you're going to take that's going to get you moving back towards that goal, understanding that over time, the more you're giving yourself these opportunities, the more that inner critic is going to conserve its own energy and say, I don't need to speak up as much. I don't need to rush to judge. I don't need to shout at Michael, AJ, Johnny to stay safe. I know that Michael, AJ, and Johnny are going to be safe because the last time I spoke up and they did that thing, nothing happened. They had a great podcast. They had an awesome interview. They gave a great speech on stage. So I, I can take today off. I don't need to be so loud today with my critique of who they are and why those goals aren't achievable. And that's the beauty of it. And when you recognize it can be developed like a muscle, well, there are some days I'm not going to hit my PR in the gym. And there are other days I'm going to surprise myself and I'm going to push even further than I thought I could. So the development of it is so key. I feel like I need to, we need to address at this point, because that, this is still going through the head of many a listener right now. Okay, I just need to flip the self-compassion switch and then everything is going to be easy. It's not a hack. Self-compassion is not a, a three-second hack. Three, Self-compassion is a tool that for the rest of your life you develop. And it makes, yes, it makes things a little bit easier because you have your best friend. You are your own best friend next to you as you go through the difficult process. But you, it, it is more than anything. It is a tool that gives you advice. Again, a really great question I learned from a friend to ask in difficult situations is, given that it's difficult right now and given what's happening right now, what would be helpful? And just answering questions like these, as if you were counseling your best friend, will tell you what the next step is. It might be like, hey, get all the booze out of the house. It might be, hey, you know what? I've worked so hard for an entire month. I deserve a burger. The answer will come and it's going to come from the right place and not the inner critic that just wants you to stop. I love chatting with the folks who are going through Unstoppable and, and X Factor because they're going through that process and they're learning the triggers and mechanisms to their own psychology so that they can understand when they are in a heightened emotional state due to being outside their comfort zone and pursuing what it is they want to engage in. It's usually a passion, right? It's usually something that they've always wanted to do. And when they understand those triggers and mechanisms, they now understand that there's a choice to be made in that moment. Turn away from growth or turn towards growth. Now, like anything, at the beginning of the program, when I just when I talk with everybody, they're a bit frustrated. They're like, they're they're going through the motions, they're learning all this stuff. It's like there's a lot of information. It's some would say it's like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, but they they realize they're in this process and they're like, I'm at the beginning of it. It's a bit scary. Uh, I'm, I'm going through the, the, the homework and I'm starting to, to get a handle of it. Two, three weeks later, it's like talking to a completely different person. They're standing up taller. They're more excited about what they have going on. And all of a sudden, when we're doing... At the beginning of every session, we discuss the wins for the week. Well, those people are always then the first ones to, to go because they're excited about all this new stuff that they're taking on that they've always wanted to. And I usually don't see them for a couple of weeks after that because a trip is usually the first thing on the bucket list that they're going to check out. It's a trip or it's a cruise. And then when they get back, it's, I'm working on this new business. I recently reached out to some family members who I haven't talked to in a long time that I'm looking to rebuild this relationship with. I mean, the excitement is just pouring out of the screen. And of course it affects and infects everybody else on that call to where they are getting fired up. And I love that. And, and my favorite is just, I, I always count the weeks from when they start until I, I see that moment. 
and uh, and it, it's always right on cue. And let's be honest, what we're talking about here can be really hard on your own. It can be really hard to develop the self compassion on your own when you're feeling up against it, when you're feeling rocked from that inner critic. And that's why the group support and the coaching comes in to add a new perspective. So you're not battling it alone. You're not frustrated in those moments where you can't find the self-compassion. You can actually draw that self-compassion from seeing others participate in these difficult things and others wrestle with their inner critic and come out the other side. Oftentimes when we think about these things that are really impactful in our life, it can feel even tougher when your back's against the wall, when you don't have anyone else in your life that's growth minded or is working through the same inner critic frustration or is feeling that perfectionism or is feeling that imposter syndrome. But being surrounded in a group full of people who are facing the same challenges, whose inner critic is saying the same things to them and seeing them grow, as Johnny's saying in that session each week and seeing them stand a little bit taller, well, that can give you that extra ounce of energy you need to move towards that goal, to move around the inner critic. And that's the beauty of the group coaching. And that's the amazing part of Unstoppable is tapping into this community of people working on the exact same things, this inner dialogue, this inner dialogue with this critic that in the past has kept you from those goals that are so important to you. The other powerful piece to that as well is being able to recognize whether or not there are flawed circular thinking that is going on that is keeping you from progressing. And that's quite difficult because this is from uh, the patterns that have set in, you're basically bullshitting yourself and accepting some of this circular thinking and it will keep you as if you're not making that progress. Having other people in that group coaching who are able to recognize those patterns because they have unlocked those patterns in themselves. They have found the clasp that holds that circular thinking together and they have been able to break it. And so uh, after 15 years, I mean, that's one of the jobs that we have at AOC is being able to recognize those patterns. But what's fun about this is when you go through that process then you are able to begin to see these patterns. And again, this contributes to what we call seeing the matrix. So having run uh, Unstoppable and, and the previous programs that were all around confidence building, very often participants are, are so kind and they send in uh, written testimonials or they record a video. And I like one of the testimonials that really stood out for me was this amazing lady that put so much work into the program. And when she recorded, it was just a small little audio message, but the gist of it was, she said, you know, Michael, I joined your program because I wanted to get confident. And I certainly did that. But what the program really allowed me to do myself is to, for the first time in my life, love myself. And that still gives me goosebumps thinking about that, how, how many people are out there that are their own worst enemy. And they don't have a kind word for themselves when, when all the power lies in self-compassion and being your best friend and, and supporting yourself and not just constantly beat yourself up. So let's, let's bring more of that into the world and get people closer to their goals and their ambitions and quieten that dang inner critic and then be done with it.